Now that we've discussed shared memory as a means of uh, inter-process communication, let's look at, have a look at the second uh, model, which is message passing. Uh, so in the case of message passing, uh, the processes are communicating with each other, uh, not by using shared variables in the shared memory, but through what we call the mailboxes. Uh, so in the uh, uh, use of uh, message passing as an IPC method, we have two primitives. A primitive is just a simple function call, actually. Uh, one primitive is for sending messages, and the other one is for receiving messages. And these messages could be either fixed or uh, of variable size. So if we have two processes, say P and Q, that want to communicate, uh, you should first set up a link between these two processes and uh, then start exchanging uh, messages using these send and receive primitives. But there are some questions to be uh, discussed, like how are the links established between these two processes, P and Q? Uh, can a link have more than two processes? So is it possible to have a link between P, Q and also R? How many links can there be uh, between every pair of processes? In other words, can P and Q have multiple connections, multiple links in between? For example, uh, one for exchanging data and the other one uh, for exchanging uh, comments or control signals between the processes. Like one tells what to do with the data and the other one tells the data itself. Uh, what's the capacity of a link? By the capacity of a link, we mean how much uh, data can be in transit at any point in time. That means uh, P, for example, sends uh, a message to Q, but Q has not uh, read it yet. So the message goes to Q, but still Q has not issued a receive command on that. So that message is still waiting there. And P sends another one, another one, another one. How many messages can P send before the system says, okay, hold on, I cannot uh, keep all these messages, so wait until Q starts reading them. Does this ever happen? And if it happens, when does that happen? That's the capacity of that link. Uh, this, for the size of the message, is it fixed or variable? And for the links, is it unidirectional or bidirectional? That means, uh, is the communication always, say, from P to Q, or could it be that P sends to Q and Q also sends to P over the same link? So these are uh, questions to be answered. So uh, for the implementation of this link between the two processes, we can look at it from the physical perspective or the logical perspective. For the physical perspective, you could do it over shared memory. You can still implement uh, Queues, message queues using shared memory actually. Uh, so uh, the uh, queue itself is in the shared memory. So when you say send, actually you're writing something to the uh, array, uh, for example, in the shared memory and similar is uh, true for receive. Or the hardware bus, or you could also implement it over the network as we'll discuss later. Uh, from the logical perspective, uh, are we talking about a direct communication between uh, the two processes, so P is sending to Q, or in an indirect manner, like P is sending somewhere and Q is picking it up from that position? That's uh, to come in the discussions. Uh, are we talking about synchronous communications or asynchronous communications? And are we talking about, again, automatic buffering or explicit buffering? So, first, about the direct and indirect communications. Let's first uh, focus on direct communications. In the case of direct communications, P explicitly says, I'm sending this message to process Q. Okay, so uh, they're actually naming each other. P sends messages uh, to Q, or uh, Q receives a message uh, from P. Uh, That's how things are working. Uh, so for such a communication link, the links are established automatically. So you just say, I want to talk to Q. So the system itself sets up a connection with Q and then sends the messages on that over that connection, over that link. Uh, the link is associated with exactly one pair of communicating processes. 
That means P says I want to communicate with Q. Over this link, you can only send messages to Q. You cannot send messages to R over the link because that link only goes to Q. Uh, between each pair of uh, processes, there exists only one link. And the link uh, may be either unidirectional or bidirectional. Uh, that means one way or both ways. However, in the case of uh, indirect uh, communications, uh, the messages are not sent to specific processes, but instead you're sending them to a mailbox. So the process, rather than saying I'm sending this message to process P, it says I'm putting the message here in this mailbox. Now, if the other process also goes to the same uh, mailbox and picks the messages, if any, from that mailbox, P and Q are not directly communicating, but they're communicating in an indirect manner over some mailbox. So for each mailbox, we need a unique identifier that will uh, mean, that will specify only that mailbox. And the processes uh, will be able to communicate now in the case of indirect communications only if they have a shared uh, mailbox. So it's, uh, if, uh, for example, uh, P is writing to this mailbox and Q is picking up from this mailbox, they would not be able to communicate. Therefore, they should have that uh, common or shared mailbox. Uh, the link between these uh, processes now should be uh, is established only if they have a common mailbox, as we said. The link uh, may be associated with many processes. Uh, that would be like, uh, for example, you put your uh, request in a special mailbox, but there could be several processes that are reading from there. Or vice versa, there could be multiple processes writing to, the, uh, to that uh, mailbox and only one reading from there, or even multiple writing to the same mailbox and multiple taking it. Uh, we can explain that with a uh, real life example. So for the first case, uh, it could be like, I'm, write, I'm writing my requests into a mailbox, but there are several servers that are reading from there, and I don't care which one is reading, just for the sake of the example. For example, when you do a search uh, operation, say, over Google, actually Google does not have a single server. There they have a server farm, so there are many servers that are taking those requests and uh, fulfilling those requests, searching uh, for those queries. Now, does it matter for you which one of those servers in the server farm responds to your request? It doesn't matter. The only thing you want is you want the results. So you don't care who finds the result for you. You just want the result. So in that case, we have one uh, writer and multiple readers, and we don't differentiate between the readers. What if it's not only you who's doing the searches on Google, but many people? So in that case, there will be many writers to the same port and many readers, uh, many uh, servers in the server farm. Or uh, it could be multiple writers, one server. Uh, this would be like, for example, you go to the pharmacy and assume that there's only one person uh, working in the pharmacy. So there would be many customers making requests and only one uh, serving it. So all these are different uh, possible combinations. Uh, for each pair of processes, there may they may share several communication links. So, uh, as I said uh, in the previous uh, slides, uh, you could have two processes, for example, this time not with direct links, but uh, with uh, indirect mailboxes, uh, communicating for different purposes through different uh, mailboxes. And the links, again, may be unidirectional or uh, bidirectional. Note that in the case of indirect communications, if it's important for you who is 
reading from that mailbox, then indirect communications becomes a little bit of a trouble. That means I make a request, but I want always the same person to respond to it. Okay, so I'm picking actually between the servers. I don't want this server, I want this server. In that case, if both servers read from the same mailbox, that would be a problem because uh, say if you have uh, two servers, S1 and S2, and you want actually S2, but S1 happens to read the message, but it has already taken the message from the mailbox, so S2 will not be able to take it. So in the case of indirect communications, that would be a problem. So depending on what you want to do, actually, you pick up different uh, approaches. So the possible uh, operations are creating a new mailbox or also called a port. You should be able to send messages and receive messages. And when you're done with the mailbox, you should be able to uh, remove the message. So you need primitives, as I said, for these purposes, for creating, destroying, sending and receiving. So here we're given only two of those uh, primitives. Uh, when you want to send something, uh, you say, send this message to mailbox A. Pay attention, in the previous case, we were sending to process P. This time we're not talking about the process, but we're talking about the mailbox. So we say, send, write it to mailbox A, and hopefully someone will read from there. And uh, similarly, when you want to read something, you say, receive from mailbox A, and whatever you read, put it in this parameter. As I said, it is possible for processes to share mailboxes. Uh, like you can have P1, P2, and P3 sharing the same mailbox. So it could be that P1 is the writer and P2 and P3 are the receivers. So they are the ones that are giving the service or vice versa, however you wish. Uh, but then in this case, as I said, uh, the problem is who gets the message when there are multiple readers here. Uh, if it's important, if it's not important for you, no problem. But if it's important, then how do you uh, solve that? So the possible solutions are you allow a link to be associated with at most two processes. So P1 and P2. So since P3 cannot access the mailbox, you don't have that problem. Of course, this would be the trivial solution. Or you allow only one process at a time to execute a receive operation. So if P2 and P3 try to receive at the same time and say there's only one message, either P2 or P3, who tries to access first, gets that message, but the other one will just have to wait because the message uh, is not uh, split into two. And uh, another solution could be you allow the system to select uh, arbitrarily the receiver, especially in the case if it doesn't matter whether P2 or P3 is giving the service, uh, then you could select that arbitrarily. This would also be nice if you're trying to distribute the load, if you have such an arbitration mechanism. And the sender in that case would be notified, for example, who the receiver was. Uh, so we, when we talk about such uh, inter-process communications, especially in the case of message passing, you need synchronization. So uh, this synchronization can be done either in a blocking manner or in non-blocking manner. In the case of blocking uh, approach, uh, one of the processes, for example, the reader, waits until the writer, someone, sends the message. Okay, so uh, the one who's trying to read from the message box will be blocked. That's why we call it blocking will be blocked until the other one writes there. Therefore, they will be synchronized. The reader process, say P1, will not be able to proceed, that means execute the next instruction, until P2 has reached a specific instruction, which is the write instruction. That's why we have that synchronization. Uh, so you can have uh, what I explained would be the case for blocking receive because the receive operation there was blocked or you can also have uh, the blocking sent where the sender is blocked 
until the message is received. So it will be like uh, you write some, you say, send this message, but you will not be able to proceed with the next instruction until that uh, message is received by the other party. In the case of non-blocking operations, now we are talking about asynchronous operation. That means process P1, for example, uh, does a non-blocking send. So it sends, it's not important whether the other party, say P2, has received it or not. It will just say, send this message. It may take time to send it here for various reasons, as you will see in the future, but P1 immediately continues with the next instruction. Although maybe the message has not been received by P2 yet, or maybe it was received. We have no idea about that. Okay, That's why these are not synchronized. Therefore, uh, this is asynchronous communications. Now we have the requirement that the instruction in P1 just after send should not be dependent on, therefore should not be assuming that the message was received by P2 because we cannot guarantee that. If you make such assumptions, you could uh, have uh, arbitrary solutions. Okay, So your program would not be working in a deterministic manner. Or you can also have non-blocking receive operations. Uh, in the case of uh, non-blocking receive, uh, the receiver will uh, try to read something from the uh, message box, but maybe it will be possible, maybe not. If there's something in the mailbox, it will successfully receive it, so you will have a valid message in hand, but it is possible that you try to read from the uh, message box, but the message box was empty, but rather than blocking the process that wants to read, it will just say, there's nothing in it, okay? So in that case, you should be careful to check whether the read operation was successful or not. So you shouldn't assume that you successfully read a message and continue on that message because that message could be null. Uh, but there are also different combinations that are possible. Uh, if both the send and the receive operations are blocking, that means the sender cannot uh, continue until the receiver uh, has read it and vice versa, then we have a strict rendezvous case. In this case, if we go with this approach, uh, using the message boxes, the producer-consumer problem actually becomes trivial. Okay, so uh, you just uh, say uh, send a message and it will be placed in the message box and you can proceed. Okay, you can produce the next item, send it, produce Net send, produce send. You can work in this manner. Of course, if the uh, buffer uh, for this uh, link is full, then the last send operation will be blocked because the buffer is full until the consumer receives something. So it removes something from the buffer. So there will be some opening in the buffer and the blocked uh, producer process may continue. And all the details of this would be handled by the operating system. So it is easier uh, for the programmer to use the message boxes. But the problem here is these send and receive uh, primitives are implemented by the kernel because you have to access the uh, message box, which is in the kernel space. Therefore, uh, it will be slow. It's easy to program, but the execution of uh, the message boxes is slower compared to the uh, shared memory case. Uh, now, how about the uh, buffering uh, of the uh, these connections? Uh, there is actually a queue that manages all this operation. So when you want to send a message, uh, the message uh, goes to the, uh, the queue. So the message is placed uh, in a queue. Uh, 
uh, it's implemented in one of the three ways. Either your link has zero capacity, that means the queue size is zero. In that case, when you want to write something, the uh, process, the writer process, cannot continue until the reader process, the uh, consumer, takes that. Therefore, there is again a strict rendezvous between the uh, sender and the receiver. Or an alternative approach is you have fi some finite length of n messages. So as long as the number of messages that have been sent but not received yet by the uh, receiver, they would be waiting in the buffer of the link. Therefore, until you have n messages there, the sender and the receiver will work without blocking. But when the link becomes full and you want to send a new message, you cannot continue. You have to wait until the receiver removes something uh, from the link so that there is some opening in the buffer. And for the third approach, you have unbounded capacity. That means you have an infinite length of queue. In that case, the sender never waits because there's always sufficient uh, buffering space for you to execute. As I said, in no real system you have infinite capacity, but it is possible that uh, in your system the link capacity is so high that you never reach that limit. So for all practical purposes, you can assume that you have infinite uh, buffer space.